Welcome to Whores Talk Horror. We're not really whores. We just like wordplay. Hello and welcome to Whores Talk Horror. I'm Sharon. And I'm Melinda. So today's story is one I've wanted to tell to Sharon and all y'all for months now. And I'm equally terrified and beyond fucking psyched to finally get to talk to you all about Catherine Mahaffey Shelton, a former criminal defense lawyer from Texas. And like many of you right now, your reaction is probably like mine was. Who? Um, This has been a really weird story to research uh, for a few reasons that I'll go into in a bit, but I'll get it out of the way. Why are we talking about a random criminal defense lawyer from Texas, you might ask? Um, Well, one night a few months ago, I turned on, it was either the ID channel or Oxygen, and got up to like go get water or whatever I was doing, and then heard... Killed one husband, sent another to prison, and scared an ex so bad he ran off to join the Marines. And I was back on that couch before that last sentence even ended. And by the end of the hour, I totally knew who Catherine Shelton was. So this is a big story, and there's a lot of moving parts. I think this will work best if we start slow and then let the drama unfold, kind of like how I experienced it. So uh, I just say, let, let's just get this crazy train running, yeah? Totally. It's been a long time since you've told me a story, so I'm excited. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm excited, too. Okay, so before we do hop on that crazy train, hopefully it goes without saying that whenever we're discussing true stories, we, as in Sharon and I, and then as I'm sure all you all as well, understand that these things happened to real life people who got hurt or even worse. While we will make jokes occasionally, uh, we never intend to hurt any victims or their families. But we're going to absolutely have plenty to say for this one, uh, though it'll mostly be at Catherine's expense. So we should be good. But I wanted to make that clear. Um, Before you get started, Mindy, what was so weird about researching this story? Uh, well, for one thing, I can't find the show that I initially watched where I heard the story. Dum dum uh, dum. Kath- <laughs> Catherine, but like Catherine was covered on like an episode of Forty Eight Hours called "The Law and Mrs. Shelton," of which I actually was able to find an article about because it was produced by CBS, but not the video. But then I like if Forty Eight Hours. Even if that was even what I watched, like, I don't even I'm not even sure. Um, I saw maybe a few brief news clips on YouTube, but I didn't really stream anything aside from whatever special I saw initially. That's still a mystery. And one other thing, but we'll get to that. Um, I also had a really hard time finding personal info on her. There's not even a Wikipedia page about her. Everyone has a Wikipedia page. Rumor on the streets is that uh, she's roughly about 70 years old now, still alive. Um, And seeing as how the majority of her story takes place before the Internet and her profession allowed her access to like privileged information. Maybe that's why certain details are so scarce online. I don't really know. But I was actually thinking that while you were saying you had a hard time finding stuff was one was she still alive? And two, yeah, maybe because she's a lawyer, she knew ways to brush the internet clean through legal, legal ways, legal devices to, uh, yeah, clear some of this info about her from uh, public domains. I don't know. Um, I would have no doubt, honestly. <laughs> um, but the other thing, too, is that the story really starts like in 19... 19- Well, she was probably born sooner, but for our purposes, it starts in like 1969 and goes all the way to at least like 2007. So there's a lot of pre-internet time that this stuff took place during, which I know, you know, microfiche got copied on a digital whatever. But yeah, I just thought maybe those two things combined, like, yeah, she was a lawyer and this is kind of an old story. I don't know. I did find one Dallas Observer article that mentioned that Catherine was born in the Philadelphia area and then moved with her family to Houston at age four 
and then quickly gained a rep on the playground as a tomboy who was never afraid to take on other girls or boys in schoolyard fights. Uh, Catherine's parents also apparently ran a daycare center in southwest Houston, and her father passed away in early 1978 from national from natural causes and that's kind of all i know really about her family um as far as you were gonna say (laughs) sorry thought you were gonna say national causes i did that's why i stopped like he was too patriotic (laughs) and that's what killed him sorry go ahead (gasps) i mean i don't know i couldn't find any (laughs) info for all i know that's true um so uh, for Catherine. um After high school, she enrolled at the University of Texas in Austin, uh, and Catherine met husband number one, Matt Quinlan, in 1969, and the two quickly married. Uh, When Quinlan, who was a Navy lieutenant, was given an assignment overseas, Catherine went with him all the way to Japan in 1969. Alas, the love affair was short-lived, and by 1970, Catherine was divorced back home in Houston and had found her calling. She wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, So that was fast. Uh, Catherine attended law school at the University of Houston, during which time she briefly dated uh, fellow law student Ferris Bond. Ferris Bond. I know. Bond. Ferris Bond. (laughs) I know. It's like Ferris Bueller's dream come true name, probably. Wow. The uh, characteristics of Ferris Bueller mixed with James Bond would make for like, that's like the ultimate superhero, like cunning, charming, and can sing (laughs) Donkashane. I need to see that movie yesterday. Okay. (laughs) Ferris Ferris Bond's day off. All right. Aw. I'm sorry. I need to stop interrupting with stupid. No, jokes. it's ahead. fine. It's actually it takes the pressure off a little bit. So, I mean, maybe not for Spencer because I love to edit it. But <laughs> oh no, I'm leaving that in. Um, while the romance may have been brief, the breakup was long and unpleasant. So much so that immediately upon graduation, Ferris Bond said that he took his law degree, joined the U.S. Marine Corps, and quietly relocated to another state, glad to be out of Catherine's life. Catherine herself passed the bar exam in June of 1977. Now, don't worry. We'll come back to Matt Quinlan and Ferris Bond. Please hold all questions for now. So, in 1976, the unlucky in love Catherine met anesthesiologist George Tedesco and the two quickly became exclusive hmm I'm sensing a pattern here sure enough by late 1976 Catherine was sharing Tedesco's townhouse in southwest Houston so FYI everybody George Tedesco and the events of 1977 through 79 almost pretty much solidified Catherine Mahaffey's name in all of the Houston papers and press. So I'm going to start getting into a little bit more detail here. But I just I thought it was important to lay down a very, very basic backstory before we really start getting to know our friend Catherine here. The payoff will be worth it. Trust me. So back to late 1976. Uh, Catherine is living with her new love, George Tedesco, and it's all bliss. Just kidding. After a whirlwind three to four month romance, things soured and George called it quits in 1977. But since nobody puts Kathy in a corner, she (laughs) sued Tedesco in divorce court, claiming that as his common law wife, she was entitled to at least half of George's assets. The fuck? You go, girl. (laughs) Oh, wait, is that not a good thing? I don't know this story. Well, my was not my reaction. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I mean, if you're sharing, you're like, you go, girl. But I was like, fuck. Because wh- common law wife for form what? Well, back in the mid to late 1970s, Texas actually had a law that allowed couples to declare themselves common law married without the trappings of a ceremony if they chose Uh, There was no actual evidence really to suggest that Catherine and George were common law married. But just FYI, that was that was a thing. After three to four months. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, this is Texas. Is anyone surprised? Yeah. Well, regardless, George called bullshit 
lawyered up and refused to let Catherine intimidate him. And it was around this time that George actually also reported that some items had been stolen from his townhome, like some pieces of art here and there, but just like random stuff, you know. Finally, finally, a trial date for the divorce hearing was set for January 15th, 1979. But George didn't show. In fact, George failed to appear to assist in a scheduled surgery the previous Friday. Concerned, police headed to the Tedesco home for a wellness check. Um, And to describe what happened when the cops went to check on George Tedesco, I'm actually going to read an excerpt from um, Luggage by Kroger, a true crime memoir, a book by Gary Taylor. Taylor was the criminal courthouse reporter for the Houston Post back in 1979 and eventually one of Catherine's playthings. Um, His his book Luggage is his account of his relationship with Catherine. Um, Also, I realize that this is a horror podcast, but trigger warning for descriptions of extreme violence and gross stuff, just FYI. Okay, so from Taylor's book, When Houston homicide detectives arrived at the townhome of George Tedesco, they found a gruesome scene in the garage. The police had found blood seeping from under the garage door and drag marks leading to George's body in the back. A metal pipe wrapped in a rag lay beside him on the concrete floor. It was surmised it was used to bash his skull. Repeated blows had splintered the bone crushed his right eye, broken his nose, and knocked out several teeth. At first, theft of the doctor's missing silver Corvette appeared a possible motive, but the sheer viciousness of the attack made that seem kind of like overkill. Instead, police were already knew that Tedesco had spent the last year embroiled in a messy and unusual common law divorce case. In fact, the trial of that divorce had been scheduled for that very day january 15th 1979 question yes i think we're gonna need to do quick rehashes (laughs) it's like quick little summaries so catherine and george never officially got married in a court no they were common law married technically only together for three to four months so says catherine but because of texas law they had to go through an official divorce process. Well, no, she, she so they were common law married. So said Catherine and she filed the suit in divorce court against him and pulled that shit. So she he, he did not see it that way. Basically, there was a Texas law that said that you could be common law married, but there's no evidence to say that they had said that they were common yeah, law married. Yeah, yeah, so right. it was really on her to say, we're married. I want to go to through a divorce so I can get half your shit. Yeah, basically. Well, that, that's what yeah. I meant. Maybe I didn't phrase it correctly, but basically, yes, she. OK, so she was the only one that wanted this divorce. And because he didn't want to give up half of his assets, he ended up dead. And now this guy, Kroger, no, wrote- Kroger was just the name of the book. Oh, Luggage by Kroger? Yeah, isn't that? Yeah. Oh, are they talking about the That's- supermarket chain? But- I don't know, because from what I've read of it, I've not gotten to a part that mentions anything about luggage or Kroger. <laughs> I was going to say, that's kind of a weird title. <laughs> but the um, the the author is the, that w- we Gary will get Taylor. him shortly. But uh, yeah, yeah. And I'll just oh, call sorry. him Taylor. I guess... I guess I assumed Catherine was the luggage. Like, that was a metaphor. I Uh, literally don't know what the title means. I haven't gotten that far. Huh. We should look that up. But, okay, so he somehow, though, he saw this crime scene? No. No. He he wrote the book after everything was all said and done years later. Got you. Okay, so he wasn't at the crime scene. He didn't witness this. Because my question was, how did he witness this crime scene and somehow end up as like a plaything of hers. I'm guessing no. that means they were in a, a relationship somehow. Yeah, no, 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 no. She, they hadn't even met each other. They didn't even know each other yet. Got, okay. But he wrote a book years later about his experiences and that was like his, you know, literary description of the crime scene. I don't know. 
All right. Cool. Yeah. All right. Before okay. before we end this episode, we're going to have to look up what luggage by Kroger means because that's the weirdest name for a, a book on this subject that I could think of. Well, and the book, I mean, the re- I was skimming through it because it's just all about like how much in love with her. This is a side note, but like it's it's just it's it's feels ta- a tad misogynistic, but like he he basically just like fell for her and she was a crazy bitch, which there's more to that, which I will tell you shortly. Um, but I was like, I'm not interested in hearing how, about how charming she was. Like, I was just skimming through for, like, the facts about the crimes and stuff like that. So I, that's why I'm like, I don't actually really know what the title means. Like, I got it from Kindle Unlimited. I was looking for the facts I needed to know and didn't really care about his musings on Catherine's hair. Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Spencer PD is going to look that up. But OK, thank you for clarifying all that. Um, get back to the story now, Mindy. I, I okay. apologize. All right. I, that was rude of me. Get back to no. the story now. Mindy, please continue. <laughs> that sounds so much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just to reiterate, turns out they found George dead the day he was supposed to show up for his divorce trial. That's in- kind of an interesting scene, but yikes about that crime scene, right? Like, when I read that. Oh. So, obviously, they arrested her and she went to prison and the story's over. Yeah. Well, Catherine was questioned by homicide detectives uh, who had a hunch that they were on the right track in suspecting her, but there were still too many questions. And now, again, remember, at this point, we're talking 1979 mentality, but pretty much the number one fucking question on everybody's list was, how could Catherine, a woman, have murdered a man in such a horrific and gruesome way? Um, many have, and I'm sure many more will at some point, but that's neither here nor there. Um, again, 1979, you know, different times. Um, but another head scratcher for the cops was about Catherine's pending divorce payout. Didn't she need George alive if she wanted her dollar dollar bills, y'all? Now, Catherine kind of loved fucking with everybody, but she really loved fucking with the cops. And as was recalled to Taylor, the author of our favorite book title, <laughs> um, she, she just recalled this scene uh, at the station the day George died. As she started to leave, as in the station, she, she would say, one detective leaned over and asked, just one more question. Did you love him? Cackling with laughter, Catherine would describe her response. I guess he was expecting me to break down and cry out, yes, yes, and I killed him. But I just said, no, and walked out. Damn. Yeah. That's that's the kind of sense of humor she rolls with. Um, Within days of the murder, Catherine did walk over to the Harris County Clerk's office, seeking to change her official status from, quote, estranged wife to now the widow of George Tedesco. And she wanted to get the ball rolling on a probate court battle for control of George's estate and assets. Luckily, the Tedesco family said, fuck that noise. I mean, I'm assuming that's what they said. Um, And they hired their own lawyers and a PI, and they intended to prove that Catherine actually killed George. So That's insane that after four months of dating someone, <laughs> you could sue for their entire estate and assets if somehow they die while you're together. Well, I'm not saying much because we're not done with the story yet. Um, okay. But it is insane. You're right. And so you might be asking, what did the Tedesco family PI find out about Catherine exactly? Well, so let's go back to Matt Quinlan. Remember the Navy lieutenant, husband number one, Catherine's short-lived move to Japan? Oddly, Catherine's departure from Tokyo after she and Matt split coincided with a rumored military probe investigating allegations that Catherine actually shot Matt Quinlan with his own service revolver. Years later... A prosecutor asked Catherine about the incident, saying, quote, 
you fired that bullet to get his attention. Is that correct? To which she simply replied, it got both our attention. She was never convicted. Okay, but he's alive. Well, we don't really know. We're assuming so. I think he stayed in Japan, which was probably his best decision. (laughs) Then there was Bond. Ferris Bond. (laughs) Well done. Uh, The dude who ran off to the Marines to escape Catherine. Initially, I heard that he had run off to the Marines to escape a girlfriend. And I was like, okay, that's a bit extreme. Uh, Maybe not. So after their breakup, which also lasted just like maybe a few months at that, Catherine stalked Bond for the next three years, during which time he accused her of stealing and totaling his car in a fit of rage, forcing Bond to move every three years. And no matter where he went, Catherine always found him. Bond's new girlfriend was severely attacked and beaten by an unknown assailant. Oh, and then there's the time that Bond's apartment was set on fire, along with most of his possessions, and a neighbor claimed to have seen Catherine climbing out a window just before the flames became visible. But again, nothing ever came of that. All right, I need to see a picture of this woman. Spencer, pull one up now. Continue, Mindy. And then there's poor George Tedesco. One small victory here was that no one, including the jury, bought the common law wife bullshit and Catherine got nothing from Tedesco's estate. When asked about the items that George reported missing before his death, Catherine denied she had them or claimed that she had them, but she sold them and then wouldn't divulge who she sold them to. Um, The Tedesco family's investigators managed to actually tie some stolen items to a former client of Catherine's named Thomas Bell, which led to the filing of a wrongful death suit against both Bell and Catherine, as uh, George's family alleged that the two conspired to kill George. Neither the lawsuit or Bell ever made it to court. Bell was found shot in the head by a 357 Magnum. The death was ruled suicide, and I quote, as a result of playing Russian roulette. What? I don't understand Texas, but I mean, they did just make a law banning abortion after six weeks. So, well, as as usual, uh, neither (laughs) Catherine was neither implicated in Bell's death Um, though it did sort of add to her little femme fatale reputation, definitely. Um, So short, very shortly after George's death, Catherine briefly dated Houston Post crime reporter Gary Taylor, the dude who wrote the book I quoted or quoted from earlier. Of all the stories about Catherine, this one actually seems to be the most well-known, I guess. Um, The two were only together, again, for maybe three weeks, maybe, before Taylor started seeing some red flags. Like, you know, how much Catherine really liked to talk about George's murder and had actually warned several people, quote, you better do what I say. You you know what happened to George. Oh, and then Taylor's place got broken into and items were missing. So understandably freaked out at this point, he went to the Houston DA's office and they came up with a plan to begin secretly recording Catherine's phone calls. One such recorded conversation that actually took place between Catherine and uh, Gary Taylor's roommate became infamous among law enforcement and is still known as, and I quote, the exorcist tape. In it, Catherine's tone and mood ranges from pitiful victim to vengeful rage, sobbing one moment and making threats the next. And I've not heard the actual recording, but I did see some policemen interviewed about it and they are like, oh, dude, like it's crazy. So rightfully so, fearing that Catherine might I don't know, target his family or something um, and really just wanting everything to stop. Gary Taylor finally agreed to meet Catherine at her house one evening in 1980 to retrieve the items that she'd stolen, not stolen from him. (laughs) Upon arriving at her home, Taylor was directed to a particular closet where his stuff was supposedly stored. And then Catherine started shooting. 
Now, Taylor obviously escaped since he wrote this book and everything, but not before Catherine shot him in the back as he was running out the door. Doctors said that the bullet literally was a centimeter from Taylor's heart, dead center in his chest. Wow. He is so lucky. Right? I know. I read in an article somewhere, he said, and all I kept thinking was, the bitch actually shot me. (laughs) (laughs) Is that literally what he said? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, This time, Catherine was actually arrested for, you know, attempted murder. Uh, Her legal team argued self-defense in court, and the jury was deadlocked. How is it? Okay, I'm sorry. How is it self-defense when you shoot someone in the back? That, like, goes against Everything I have ever heard, it's it, no, that's not a thing. It's not self defense if you shoot someone in the back. Sorry. Well, it's not. Um, I, I, I have like when we kind of when we come to the end and we give our final thoughts. Um, I have a little fun fact, I guess, that might kind of give you know, I, an idea as to how all this happened. It just didn't really fit in amongst like the linear part of the story as well. Um, but I mean, we'll just say, you know, she had friends due to her profession ah. in the right places. Yeah. Say no more. Yeah. White privilege. Um, yeah. I mean, and th- I think that's the other thing that kind of fascinates me in a gross way about this story and this woman is this is like utter privilege blown out of proportion. To the extreme. I digress. We'll we'll keep going. Um her, I, her second trial now, so the first one was the one that was deadlocked, but the second trial, the jury reached a guilty verdict in a little over an hour. <laughs> uh, Catherine was sentenced to 10 years, but the conviction was overturned on an appeal. Uh, Catherine ended up pleading guilty to aggravated assault and was let go on probation and temporarily barred from practicing law. Oh, and yes, everyone got to hear that exorcist tape in court in case you were wondering also fun fact should anyone wish to watch a fictionalized reenactment of the shooting incident season three episode six of the show your worst nightmare called black widow does a spectacularly overly dramatic telling of this story and gary taylor actually even appears Uh, i watched it on discovery plus but i'm sure you can find it elsewhere and it's I think it's worth a watch. Okay, so fast forward now to 1981. Catherine Mahaffey meets Clint Shelton in his family store, an old gun shop. Catherine needed a shotgun repaired, so she stopped in. Typical. Like a lot of these other guys initially, Clint fell for Catherine instantly, head over heels. Her in-laws, though, not so much. Um, In an article called The Law and Mrs. Shelton from CBS News, Richard Shelton, Clint's father, had this to say about Catherine. And I quote, she's intelligent. Don't think she's not intelligent. And she's mean to go with it. She's a bitch. 18 carat. And that's just her father-in-law talking. (laughs) Shit. But Clint and Catherine got married anyway and eventually moved to Dallas, uh, where the now... Catherine Shelton, finally, um, was able to convince a judge to allow her conviction for shooting Gary Taylor to be set aside. And he did it. So now she's no longer a felon. And you know what that means? Catherine Shelton was free to practice law again. You guys are doing good. Stick with me. We're getting to the home stretch. But there's more. So now this brings us to Michael and Marissa Hero. Marissa Hero began working for Catherine in August of 1998 after uh, Catherine Shelton had represented Marissa's husband, Michael, in a theft case. Shelton's firm then began handling immigration cases drummed up by Herero. Eventually, though, these became a contention between Marissa and Catherine, especially after immigrants began filing grievances against Catherine with the state bar saying their cases were being improperly handled or ignored. 
in March 1999, Marissa left Catherine's firm to create her own, specializing, of course, in immigration services. Shortly after, anonymous mailings began circulating that seemed to detail all of Catherine's past. And naturally, Catherine was convinced that uh, Marissa mailed them. Uh, oh, in other news, uh, at least according to Catherine, she began having an affair in September of 1997 with Bill Parker, a colleague who'd done some polygraph work on a few of Catherine's clients. Parker vehemently denies anything ever happened, but that didn't stop Catherine from getting charged with stalking Parker in February of 1998. And restraining order be damned, Catherine was arrested again for trespassing on Parker's property in December of 1999. Oddly, just six days later, Michael and Marissa were shot in their driveway. So, Monday, December 20th, 1999, Marissa told the police that she and her husband had pulled into their driveway around 7.30 p.m. or 8 p.m., a neighbor puts the time of the gunshot at 8.20 p.m. According to Marissa, her husband exited the driver's side of the car and he was killed by a masked man with a sawed-off 12-gauge single shotgun. Marissa tried to flee, fell, and was shot in the arm. Marissa says, without a doubt, she heard the voice of Catherine Shelton tell the gunman, don't be a pussy. And finish it, finish it. However, no other shots were fired. And later, the cops recovered the gun, unused and used shells, a pantyhose mask and latex gloves near the crime scene. And later that night, investigators also found what appeared to be evidence outside the Shelton's home, including a receipt for 12 gauge shotgun shells and what's described as a mask made out of dark underwear that would match the mask Marissa says Catherine was wearing. Police believed right away that Clint Shelton killed Michael Herrero with Catherine orchestrating the whole thing, despite the fact that Clint had filed for divorce only a month prior in November of 1999. Wow. Still... Clint was arrested for Michael's murder and given a life sentence. According to the DA, off the record, of course, a mountain of physical evidence tying Clint Shelton to the crime existed, including DNA, hair and saliva samples found in the pantyhose mask and even more. As of 2000, Clint went to prison and Catherine was unbelievably still practicing law. While facing more than, like, 20 allegations of professional misconduct from the Texas bar, mainly immigration matters, including claims of false advertising and that she charged, quote, unconscionable fees. Yeah. So I was hard pressed to find any recent, recent news about Catherine Shelton, with one exception, um, an article that was originally written in December of 2005 from the Houston Chronicle and, well, I'll just read a few choice excerpts. A disbarred lawyer who has drawn national media coverage for her brushes with the law, including the shooting of her boyfriend in Houston, is free on bond after being indicted on accusations that she failed to return a child to his mother. Catherine M. Shelton, also known as Catherine Mahaffey, age 57, is charged with unlawful restraint a state jail felony. She was, quote, completely surprised when police arrested her Tuesday. Shelton was released after posting $5,000 in bail. The indictment came Monday from a Harris County grand jury. Shelton is accused of taking a child to whom she is distantly related and disregarding a judge's orders to return him to his mother. According to the prosecutors, the indictment accuses her of moving the boy from one place to another. Shelton had checked the child out of a Harris County elementary school in August when she had a court order allowing her to do so. The order was rescinded, but the boy, whose age was not disclosed, still was not returned to his mother. 
After Jersey City police arrested Shelton during a traffic stop, the boy was returned to his mother, whom he had not seen since August. The article closes with, Shelton knows the father of the child she is accused of unlawfully keeping, but prosecutors said they don't know the nature of their relationship. I'm sorry, why are they calling it unlawfully keeping a child? Isn't that kidnapping? Yeah. And also... $5,000 bail. She's been arrested multiple times, including like she was on trial for attempted murder. And now she's involved in another homicide. Or I shouldn't say another homicide because I think she's she hasn't actually been charged with a homicide before. No, no. She was charged with attempted murder. She's involved in a homicide. And she only has $5,000 bail set for her. So I guess, well, it, that this would have been like early 2000s-ish. So I guess at that time in Texas, you could be a criminal, practice law, and kidnap kids, and you're all good. <laughs> as long as you're a white woman. Don't forget that That's part. the other thing. That's the other thing. Um, That's the most important it, thing. <laughs> well, regardless, there was one Ugh. other record that I was able to dig up. And from what I can see, it seems to indicate that that bitch has been disbarred. But other than that... Catherine Shelton, from what from what I know, is still alive and well, but just kind of staying on the DL. I mean, how does she even have time to practice law with all these crimes she's committing? Multitasking, Sharon. <laughs> so I know you won't believe me when I say this, but I've only scratched the surface with this story. There are so many other crazy things this lady has done both in her private and professional life. And it was extremely difficult narrowing down things to, to talk about specifically in this Mama Jamma story. Uh, fun fact alert, around the time Catherine shot Gary Taylor, CBS optioned a made-for-TV movie meant to be all about Catherine and Gary's torrid love affair. Gary Taylor would have been portrayed by actor... Isay Morales and Melanie Griffith would have been Catherine. The film's title? Heartless. Sadly for us, the film got scrapped and never even saw the light of day. That's probably a good thing because she probably would have sued to get money out of the film. Or it would have just stroked her ego. You know what I mean? Like um, One of the two. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I, I kind of feel like the story is a bit anticlimactic because um, one blog I found actually guessed her age to currently be around 72. I do have a screenshot of her public disciplinary report from the state of Texas, and she was for sure disbarred in 2007. So I would encourage folks to keep digging online. She had way more affairs than even what was mentioned, um, which like no judgment there except that most of her suitors were married. Catherine just liked to fuck with people and she would often break up with a boyfriend and then fucking call his wife and family and kindly introduce herself and say who she is and how she knows their husband and like destroy lives that way. Um, Okay, well, first, all right, sorry. But first of all, if you're dating people who have a wife and a family, I mean, you're asking for trouble as as the married person. Because you shouldn't yeah. be doing that. Um, also, yeah, if you're going to be cheating on your wife with someone like this, then, I mean, I don't know. I would kind of call that karma, but... Yeah, she also... Uh, 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 pregnancies, all sorts of hysterical pregnancies tended to happen with her. She extorted money from a bunch of her boyfriends claiming that she needed to have an abortion and then just like kept the money and ran. Thank God she never had kids. Right. I had that same exact thought. And so remember how um, George Tedesco's family, you know, hired their own set of lawyers and that private investigator. They Mm -hmm. were for real about it. And they had like a they had like a, you know, tip hotline set up and all that. And um, going back to like, it's all who you know and your privilege. Her legal team would sit in their office and fucking prank call the tip line. 
I'm not even kidding. Wow. One of them laughed about how he like called and said that he was like a pirate sailor, but knew who really killed George Tedesco. I'm not making this up. She would act as a double agent sometimes against her own friends, spying on them for like the FBI to do odd jobs. Like we could talk for hours. Do you know anything about her childhood? Or her parents? That's the thing. Not nothing. Nothing beside what I mentioned, that she was born in Philly somewhere in that area. And then they moved to Texas. And that was pretty much where she's been. Something had to have happened because like monsters like this are usually created to a point. I mean, yes, I I mean, as we've discussed in the show many, many times, it's a combination of nature versus nurture. But I'm assuming something had to have happened to her as a child for her to be this uh vindictive and malicious and sadistic and i mean yeah this is like beyond (laughs) normal behavior well i mean obviously it's way beyond normal behavior but it's like it is just almost like everything that she's done in her life is just she's not happy unless she's being extremely cruel and sadistic to someone Or if she wants something and you're in her way, you're like a bug to her. She has no conscious or or problem stepping on you to squish you out of her way. She's the female. Sorry, go ahead. Finish. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say she's the female Dirty John, basically, kind of. Yes. I was trying to think of a comparison and I kind of couldn't. Really? Because I was like, there's just and like literally you fall down rabbit holes like crazy, obviously, when you're looking into this stuff. Um, Except she's actually really smart and was a lawyer where Dirty John just pretended he was a doctor. And I don't think he was very intelligent. No, I don't think so either. But yeah, that's the other thing, too. So there's a part of me and like, you know, again, I mean this jokingly with all due respect, but like because she was a woman. And she had the job that she had and was known to be good. I mean, people were also scared of her in court for clearly obvious reasons. I'm sure you can imagine. Um, She was pretty powerful, like to be in that position in the late 70s, early 80s, um, which that's kind of impressive. But also not that killing anybody or or being, you know, a sociopath or whatever. Like not that that's admirable, but the fact that yeah, she never fucking got caught or had charges leveled against her really. Yeah. Ever. Well, like that part of me kind of was like I feel like this is that scene in Parks and Rec where April first meets Tammy one who's like cold and evil and <laughs> and April's like she's the mother I've always wanted. Like not that I would make go that far, but like yeah, it, I it, it's fascinating. Well, and as really you said, interesting. it's anticlimactic, and yeah, it's that exact reason why it's anticlimactic is because she never did any time for all these horrible things. She left a wake of uh, dead people. Their their families had to deal with the loss of their loved ones. Um, she's like ruined the lives of almost everyone. She's come into contact with where she's had any sort of serious relationship or even like a business relationship, even some of her clients, and she hasn't paid the penalty. I mean, has she served any jail time at all? No. That's insane. Anyone who ever says that white privilege does not exist or it's not a thing, fucking show them this case. This is the proof of white privilege. I mean, this is just one example, but I mean, oh, just disgusting. She saw what was available and she went for it like straight up and didn't care who or what stood in her way. And yeah, and it's rare that you we t- we have women who pull this shit off. So that was kind of another thing that was really cause she's not really a serial killer, but like obviously she's a criminal and yeah. people died and i'm like you know it, it was just fascinating also to me that it was a woman doing this so um, well i was um so i actually had an idea for an upcoming episode where we would talk about women who fall for killers like I, yeah. all the women who you know want to marry men in prison who are in there for murder or other horrific crimes just to kind of like get into their heads a little bit and understand why there are people like that who exist. And this is kind of the opposite, except obviously she never went to prison. But like 
why were so many men falling for her? Like, what was the charm of her? I'm telling I, you. I really want to know. She had a magic pussy. <laughs> it's she, the only explanation. Like, I have a friend who dated this guy and she couldn't stand the guy, but she said that he had his dick was like crack. <laughs> Um, cause he was just really good in bed. And so she couldn't like stop seeing him even though he was an idiot, but like Catherine. Yeah. I mean, that's literally when I would read quotes from the various people who are alive, who were involved with her, they would all be like, she was so charming and so stunning and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just really, really like, come on guys. I'm sorry. But it's apropos, I think, that we start to close this out with a quote from Catherine herself. And I quote, I don't ever look back at anything. Why would I? Life is an adventure. That pretty much says it all, lady. Uh, I don't know. I'm a strong believer in karma. And I just, this, this seems like karma failed. <laughs> at this point like is there going to be any retribution is is she going to pay the price in any sort of way not probably in a way that we'll see but actually you just said a second ago you're talking about like you know things she's done has alienated her from like basically everyone she's really ever loved or, or whatnot and um that guy that the guy that the um polygraph technician that she claimed to have had an affair with that she kept stalking and getting arrested at his house there was an article i was reading where she was talking about um and this was the article was from like 1999 so i don't know if she would still be in this house but she and clint her now jailed husband um had moved to this one particular home but she in her mind was thinking it would be a perfect home for when she and her imaginary sort of boyfriend ended up having a life together like the whole time this guy is going nothing ever why are you at my house get away from me and she's like planning what house they're gonna fucking buy so mm. what would like i know you're not like a psychology nurse necessarily but like obviously there's delusional stuff happening but would that be it would she's a sociopath but pathological too or that's something different um if i had to take a guess at it i would say she probably falls under the narcissistic personality disorder where mm -hmm. she has kind of like you know a grandiose uh view of herself where she feels like she's more important than other people her needs are more important her wants are more important um and she's just going to do whatever she wants to do um because she's more important than everyone else in the world so that actually does pretty much sum it up and whenever she would get mad about stuff or yell about stuff it was always why are you doing this to me or you're gonna be sorry if i have to come after you or you know it, it is always about her yeah. yeah, and I'm sure it's a combination of a few things. Um, but yeah, off the top of my head, I would say for sure that she had some type of narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah. It was weird about the kidnapping article is that it was so fucking vague. Like the way I read it, like that's how it was written. Like it was hard to read because I'm like, what are we even talking about here? Because they're like a child she's distantly sort of related to maybe like... It's just all very strange. But um, yeah, hopefully, you know, I, I do think at this point she's probably living alone in that house she thought she'd be sharing with her fake boyfriend. Well, he's real, but not her boyfriend. <laughs> she thought he was. Um, and might that might be her punishment that now she has to sit alone in her last few years i don't know i don't know but that karma question is an interesting one and I, I i just tend to believe that somehow some way even if we don't see it or it's not super obvious karma will get you no matter what yeah i i don't i don't know but i do hear you on that it's a it's a rough one because you're just left going but the bad guys won <laughs> well yeah especially for the families you know that's 
the families of her victims. That's what's the hardest is that no one went punished except for her one boyfriend who she convinced somehow to kill an innocent man, which I would love to hear his story. Like, has he talked about that at all? Have you found any sort of interview from him saying like why he did it or has he denied it completely? You mean her husband? Um, Oh, was it her husband? Sorry, I didn't. Oh, yes, yes. They did get married. Yes, because that was the sorry. She had so many relationships. It was hard to keep track. No, I know. But she was the one. um, Yes, he was the one who the family was like, she's crazy. And they didn't want their son marrying her. Yes. Yeah. She's a bitch. The father-in-law. Yeah. There you go. Um, Has he adamantly denied killing Michael or... What what is his story? He has, but I and again, like as we always say when we do this, like we're not professionals. Like there's probably a lot of stuff out there I missed, or maybe that I like, you know, whatever didn't see, whatever. But I don't. I mean, he says he says he didn't do it. Um, and she actually, interestingly enough, thank you for actually mentioning that, Sharon, because. She has like a litany, like the, like not a, well, not a litany, I guess isn't the right word, but like a full on <laughs> schedule. I was starting to think of that Matt Damon Kavanaugh sketch on SNL where he's like, my calendars. Um, <laughs> but that she literally like the night of Michael and uh, Marissa's attack slash murder, she literally can account like for every second. Um, And there was one article where she was talking with a reporter and she was like, and my mom called me at this time and we talked to her and like it was and which to me right away, I was like, that's kind of weird. Not that I and I don't know, just at this point, I'm like with her, anything's possible. Like she really I mean, now she's old and probably somewhat harmless ish, but like she really shouldn't be walking the streets in general. But like. Yeah, that to me struck me because it was so detailed that I was like, huh, it's almost as if you planned out this whole agenda you have here. And then, yeah, her 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 husband um, basically feels like he went to prison for something he didn't do. And she although they were supposedly maybe getting divorced, possibly because that was really vague, too. Um, at the time of the murder, she was like, I'm hell bent in proving that he's innocent. But that, I mean, his first chance of parole is 2030. So clearly that didn't happen. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, or maybe she's happy now that she's got everyone out of the way and she's living in this lovely home. I don't know. But at least you can't practice law, Mrs. Shelton. And we know how much you like that. So eat it. All right. Well, thank you, Mindy. That was a very, very, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, That was a very, very convoluted story that you did a very good job structuring. And I'm interested in knowing uh, a lot of the other missing details of this story because I definitely have a lot of questions. Yeah. And I don't feel like I feel like we're going to have, you know, some uh, some Catherine updates now and then because I too like I don't feel like I'm done with this. I'm like, no, I fucking want to know what's going on. You know, I want to know more where she is and how old she really is. And yeah, I want to do some digging. So we'll probably stay tuned for more updates. The Shelton hour. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But Uh, yeah, when I was literally when I was watching the documentary thing that I saw, whatever it was, and maybe it was a fever dream, who knows? But after everything, like they'd say the next thing that happened. And I just kept going, what the fuck? Just like over and over because it just wouldn't stop. I was like, how much shit can one woman do? So I was a little nervous when I kept saying to you, oh, my God, you're not going to fucking believe this, that you it was going to be a letdown. So I'm glad that you were like, whoa, so because <laughs> it is a lot to take in. But fuck, dude. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for listening to us. As always, you can write us at whores talk whore at gmail.com with anything you want to share with us. If you know where Catherine Shelton is. <laughs> If you have any other information about this story you want to share with us, 
If you know why there's a book called Luggage by Kroger <laughs> written about her, please let us know why the book is titled Luggage by Kroger. Um, also, you can share any ghost stories, any other creepy stories, whatever you want us to read on our show. If you have any ideas for upcoming episodes that you want us to talk about, let us know. Yes, yes, please. And please also subscribe to us and rate and review us. Um, it does help us get more exposure and if you're able to, please join our Patreon uh, so that you can get early access to episodes, see exclusive posts, and maybe sometimes get some cool shit in the mail. Um, as always, please be kind to each other out there. Um, be safe. And at least in Chicago, summer seems to have arrived. So happy summer. But still, be safe, everybody. Boo. And as always, sorry, ah. I'm, bo I'm booing summer. I hate summer. Sorry. What? I I was outside all morning uh, practicing putting up a tent because I'm camping for the first time ever this week, um, just me and one of my friends. So I need to know how to do that. And I'm like completely drained from being outside in the sun for just like a couple hours. I hate you, Summer. I like cool weather. Anyways. <laughs> wow. OK. Um, <laughs> and yeah, um, Sharon, don't listen. Spencer, we definitely didn't say anything about the whole going to scare them with Blair Witch thing, right? That's that's still on. Shh. <laughs> you know I love being scared, so I'm down for it. Bring it. <laughs> now I got shit fuck, to do. Yeah, fuck that. You know I won't go camping, not even for witch reasons. <laughs> you you are the least outdoorsy person I know, Mindy. <laughs> I know. I know. All right, and as always... <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for, for getting, getting creepy, creepy with us. Sharon, you want a beer? Uh, oh, my God.